Pure Passion. My name is Christine Sneeringer and I'm your host for today's program. Did you know that annual porn revenue worldwide is $57 billion? The average age of first time contact with pornography is only nine years old. 47% of Christians admit that pornography is a major problem in their homes. Or how about this? 75% of all prime time network TV shows includes sexual content. The average adolescent in the U.S. views 14,000 sexual references on TV every year, a total of over 100,000 just during their teen years. On the internet, 60% of all websites are sexual in nature. 90% of children between the ages of 8 and 16 have viewed pornography on the internet. And it's not your softcore, airbrushed, girly magazine stuff from decades ago. These children view the most vile and perverse sexual images ever conceived by the mind of man. Half of all unsolicited email today contains a pornographic message. There are more than 100,000 websites on the internet today that offer child pornography. Do we have a problem? Today's guest is Russell Willingham, a man who spends his life cleaning up the mess that our culture has created. With God's help, he tries to put lives back together that have been devastated by this plague that is destroying God's great gift of human sexuality. He is the author of one of the best books ever written on finding freedom from sexual obsessions and addictions. It's called Breaking Free, Understanding Sexual Addiction and the Healing Power of Jesus. You're not going to want to miss a minute of this interview. So call a friend and get ready for answers from, the, from God's Word and from the testimony of Russell Willingham, who has himself been set free from a bondage to pornography. Well, God led me into ministry to the sexually broken through experiencing my own sexual brokenness and uh, experiencing some healing, uh, having the Lord touch me and help me understand not only the whole sin issue, but also the whole issue of pain that was driving it for me. And uh, through counseling and through learning newer ways to be intimate with Jesus, I began to experience some freedom. And then God opened a door for me to share the same thing with other people. The Lord has set me free from several things, I think, First and foremost, he set me free from feeling worthless. That's, that's the battle underneath all the battles for me. Ever since I was easily four or five years old, just because of experiences of abuse and neglect, I've always questioned whether I was really loved or valuable or worthwhile. And that really drove me into a lot of sexual behaviors, you know, in an attempt to try to find some nurturance, some love, some acceptance, uh, even at a very early age. And that followed me into adulthood and even into my experience as a Christian. Uh, and the Lord has been showing me what the underlying issues are and how he addresses those. And that's what's been bringing freedom to me. You could even say I had a shame-based identity uh, for a variety of reasons, just being raised by parents who were really broken, as all parents are. I mean, I'm a parent as well. But... Uh, a mother in particular who struggled with some mental and emotional illnesses and was very uh, verbally and emotionally abusive, my little brother and I really questioned whether we were worth loving almost from the beginning. And I know my mom, like every mom, loved her kids, but she didn't know how to express tenderness and, and kindness. She was very critical and very uh, angry, and little children experienced that as rejection. I didn't so much go into my room and think about what happened, but I would go into my room or go into the backyard and I'd go into some kind of a, a world of make-believe. 
I was what uh, some people would call the lost child, the hidden child. I'd go and uh, I'd draw pictures, I'd fantasize, I'd, I'd play with my friends, I'd play with imaginary friends. Uh, yeah, I basically lived in my head. That was a safe place for me. Especially as a child, I had fantasies of being the hero, being the secret agent, being the most powerful, intelligent, suave man in the world. Uh, you know, James Bond was my role model and uh, just what would seem really silly to a lot of people, but basically I think I retreated to a world where I was admired, I was intelligent, I was capable, I was always the hero of the stories in my own head. I did know, at least in my mind, that God loved me in my head. And what God did for me during that time that was really special was he gave me a grandmother. Grandmothers, grandfathers are a gift from God. If the parents don't cut it, the grandparents usually do. And this woman, when my little brother and I would walk through the door, she had puzzles, she had cookies. Uh, I would have easily moved into her house if she invited me. But God in his goodness didn't allow me to live in a childhood that was totally bereft of love. So before I could come to know Jesus Christ, I knew her. And I knew she loved me and I felt safe with her. Around the age of uh, nine, in, in, a, in a fit of depression one day while I was sitting in a closet with the door closed, uh, I actually reached out to God. That was my, probably my first religious experience. And I opened up a Bible that happened to be on the floor and I began reading in Matthew chapter one, <laughs> the genealogy of who begat who and then I was totally lost. I thought, well, this is of no help whatsoever. So I didn't come back to God or the scriptures for quite a while after that. My self-hatred came from my family. It also came from uh, just beliefs that I'd started to kind of develop about myself. Uh, you know, a person experiences something and then they have a certain way of interpreting it or, or understanding it. And again, like when a, when, a little, when a little child spills his milk and the father or mother yells at him, the child doesn't think, oh, well, I made a mistake and daddy or mommy's stressed. They think, I'm a stupid, imbecilic, worthless little boy. They, they misinterpret that experience completely. They don't know that the anger in their parent is really not about the child, it's about the parent. So I, I made a lot of those same misjudgments and you know miscalculations about myself. The message in my family about being intimate or sharing your heart was, uh, it was a very scary thing to do. If, if I said what I was really feeling or I expressed my emotions, I was shamed, uh, I, was, I was ridiculed, I was told in a hundred different ways that uh, it was threatening or uh, distasteful to the adults in my life. I'll give you a for instance. Uh, because of some of the things that I just described, I struggled with depression probably since I was a little child. And uh, I saw some really weird stuff growing up, some very, very painful things, uh, like a lot of people. And, you know, sometimes I'd be sitting in a chair just feeling kind of overwhelmed by the whole thing. And, and my mom would say something like, if you're going to mope, go in your room and do that. So the message was, being depressed makes you pathetic and worthless and stupid. And so now I had two problems. Not only was I depressed about the struggles in my life, but now I felt ashamed for being depressed. The imaginary world, of course, is always more exciting and more fulfilling than a lot of the real world experiences. And of course, it wasn't long before my imaginary world began to take on a sexual uh, tone and really living in that fantasy for so long for, from early childhood really began to set me up for my own sexual addiction. Uh, images or thoughts or scenarios that I'd play out in my head and I could live there. I could, I could literally, you know, go down the street, find some place to play all by myself and be totally content, just me and, you know, the imaginary ninjas that I was fighting or whatever or the imaginary lovers that, you know, were pursuing me. Uh, but obviously it was a very lonely world. I think the fact that I was so starved for nurture, uh, just as with so many people that I work with now in my ministry who struggle with sexual addiction uh, and homosexuality and other sexual brokenness, the one thread that runs through every one of their experiences, they're, they're, they're literally dying of loneliness. They, they ache for connection and nurturance and acceptance. And, you know, for, for a burgeoning young man, it's easy for that to become sexualized, especially if, like me, you stumble onto pornography at age eight or nine 
and you start connecting dots, oh, this is how you get your needs met. This is how you'll feel loved and welcomed and accepted. And of course, it's illusory, but it's very powerful. I, I was getting a lot of guilt messages, both in the church and at home. Uh, there was a lot of sexual shame in my family, too. Even though uh, my, my parents were very promiscuous, any, any sexual play or experimentation that I might have engaged in, if, if it came to light, I was shamed and, and judged and criticized for that, as if there was something uniquely wrong with me for even considering such a thing. So there was a real double standard, and that too was very confusing. Pornography, especially images of, of adult women with all of their clothes off and all of the things that happened in pornography, it, it projected the, the, uh, the feeling of intimacy. I mean, here you are seeing a woman in the most intimate of, of settings, or a man and a woman, and of course it's all photography, it's all acting, but uh, scripture says in Proverbs 27, 7, to the one who is full, even honey is loathsome, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing tastes sweet. And I was hungry. I was desperately hungry. And the, the, the bitter, poisonous fruit of pornography tasted like nourishment to me. It made me feel like, again, in my fantasy world, now I'm connecting with an adult female, someone who will love me and, and literally show me every part of her body. But it was all fantasy. But it was all I had. One thing that I've seen both by experience and in scripture is that Satan always attacks us by uh, questioning our identity. When he came to the Lord Jesus in the wilderness, the first thing he said is, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. He was tempting him to question his identity. So that's the first thing the enemy goes after, is he, he causes us to question our identity, our worth, our value. It's the oldest trick in the book, but it's, it's very effective. And so that was happening, I think, th primarily through the dysfunction in my family. Satan was using that. And not surprisingly, I also began to get involved in some occult ideas and reading and practices. I was very fascinated with that. So I was definitely being drawn in that direction by the demonic. So yeah, there's a real connection there. Apart from maybe the loneliness, the, the, the lack of nurturance, probably the bigger factor for me was just plain old sin. Uh, I, I was and I am a sinner. And a sinner basically decides he's going to get his meed, needs met in the way that he wants to. And he doesn't want anybody telling him how to do that or when to do that. So obviously there was a, there was a deep root of rebellion in me and uh, an insistence on doing things my way. So that was probably the bigger problem. My own family experience was very, very painful. But what I've learned so far in my journey is that it was that very pain and that abandonment that, that literally pushed me into the arms of Jesus. Now I realize that that's not how everybody responds. Some people run from God, but that has been the primary motivation for me to run to Jesus and to continue doing so to this day. I had started to become so out of control, I was literally cruising bookstores and uh, any place that I could find either sex manuals or, or pornographic material. I was underage. I didn't care. I didn't care if I got caught. I didn't care if I was looking at something you know, in front of a, a store full of customers. I was just looking for the next fix. And uh, I, was, I was really sliding down a slippery slope. And I remember, too, that on one occasion, uh, my mother and I had an argument. I was about 14 at the time. And it was at the dinner table. And I was, I was at the table with my shirt off. And she was so mad about something that I'd said or something that I did that she took a, a spoonful of mashed potatoes. And she flung it at me. And it, it, it landed on my chest. And of course, it was piping hot. but. You know, the physical pain was not half as bad as the emotional pain. And that, that experience just typified so much of what I felt from my mom. And I went into my bedroom, I, I, I closed the door, and I pounded on the wall in the darkness, and I cursed God. I dared him to kill me. I begged him to kill me, in fact, because the pain, the, the sense of rejection, which is what I'd known so long, was so profound. So that's, that's not my only moment of darkness, but that was a significant one in adolescence. There's a real ambivalence that happens where, you know, you begin to, to, to hate or resent women. Uh, I think a lot of men who struggle with sexual addiction, they're very schizophrenic in this regard. They, they resent women for the power, supposedly, they have over them, and yet they crave women's acceptance. So it's this crazy kind of split-off thing that happens in our hearts, and I definitely felt it. 
I both feared women and resented their sexual power over me, and at the same time I craved what they had to offer. So I was, I was definitely double-minded, as the scripture says. I surrendered to Jesus Christ in 1978 at the age of 16. And at the time, I was on a spiritual search. My sexuality was really uh, not at the forefront of my thinking at that time. I'd become a seeker, <laughs> and I was reading all kinds of books and you know, investigating all kinds of religions. But I really, I think I can say with a clear conscience that I was seeking the truth. I was, I was looking for what was real. I was willing to shelve whatever else I was holding on to if I found it. And God in his mercy sent me somebody to share the gospel with me. And it's like, my thought is, I knew that. I've been going in circles all these years. What was I thinking? And I surrendered afresh to Jesus. And I didn't have a great dramatic experience. I just kind of became a disciple in a quiet sort of way. But it was very real for me. It was heartfelt. And I have basically been growing in my relationship with the Lord since then. The first thing that attracted me to him was uh, his statement in John 14, 6. Of course, a very well-known scripture, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everybody I'd been reading, every guru, every teacher, you know, every spiritual leader, basically said, well, I know the way to the truth, or I, I have a, a philosophy or an insight, but no one said, I am the truth. And that stopped me dead in my tracks, and I began to realize, well, I don't need to look any further then. Jesus is the one I've been looking for all this time. That's what got me through the door. I didn't understand Jesus' death on the cross or his resurrection or being filled with the Holy Spirit. All I knew was it was like all the arrows were pointing to Christ, finally, and I was listening now. But I think what began to really help me after that was slowly, and it was such a long process, beginning to know that I really was loved by God, not just in a, you know, a general sense or a, a, a generic sense, but a very personal way. He loved me. He was seeking me. He wanted to have a relationship with me more than I ever wanted to be with him. And that love over the years has slowly worn down my shame. I have to confess that this is still an ongoing battle for me. When I'm tempted with lust or when I see a, a young woman that I want to look at in a lustful way, I have to stop and say, now wait a minute. As, as beautiful as she is, as, as attractive as that may be, I'm looking in the wrong direction. That woman cannot meet my needs. And as a, as a married man, even to say, well, I could go home and be with my wife, but even that, as good as that is, will not touch this deeper core in me. I've, I've had enough experience with the Lord now that I know his love alone is truly adequate and sufficient. And so I, I make a mental shift. And when I first began doing this, 10 or 15 years ago, it was the hardest thing in the world. Like you said, you talked about central lust, that's a good term. For me, it was my guiding principle. It was, it was, it was my true north, I hate to say. That, because, as I said, from childhood, that, that became my, my core way of understanding life. So getting unplugged from that was very difficult, and the spiritual warfare was very intense, especially psychologically and emotionally. But I kept at it as, as I, I felt the Lord was giving me some tools, and so I kept holding on to those, and they began bringing freedom in time. The main way that God freed me from that sense of, I'm, I'm more messed up than anyone else, or I'm, I'm inherently defective, was, uh, like everybody, I, I have these little dreams or desires or longings in my heart. And again, because of my upbringing, I just kind of shamed myself for that. I'd say, well, that's stupid. That's never going to happen. That's silly. You're not, you're not one of the beautiful people. You're not one of the wealthy people. It's never going to happen. And I just put it out of my mind. I was even embarrassed that I'd had a thought like that. And slowly in my relationship with the Lord, God would drop little things in my life that were almost like uh, wish fulfillment, you might say. Just some little thing that I, you know, I, I, boy, I wish I could do that, or boy, it would, be, it would be cool if I could have that thing. God would give it to me. And it's like I'd be stunned. I'd say, this isn't supposed to happen. I'm not supposed to have this kind of thing. I'm not supposed to enjoy this kind of experience. I don't belong in this place. And I could hear the Spirit saying, yes, you do. I'm putting you there. And slowly over time, I began to realize, you know what? I'm no better or worse than any other person. And in fact, because of, of God continuing to whisper his love to me by the Spirit and through the Scriptures, and by 10,000 circumstantial things that he's done, I've come to see that I'm really special to him, in fact. And I'm not ashamed to say that. He really spoils me. He really... 
he tells me a lot of loving and affirming things. And, and I need to hear those all the time. I have to reach back and hold on to the Word of God. And what I mean by that is not just I grab my Bible and I read a, ver a verse. Because some of your viewers may not understand or agree with this, but in my view, the Bible alone doesn't have the power to set you free. The Bible is written, or I should say it's read by people in all kinds of different religions and philosophies. It doesn't change them. But the Spirit has to quicken it to the person's heart. The, it's still the inspired Word of God, but you know, as, as the Lord Jesus said, it's the Spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak are Spirit and life. And the Lord has said things to me either through Scripture or apart from Scripture, but of course that are certainly in agreement with Scripture. And I've written those things down. Those have become my, uh, my manifesto, you might say. Those, those things that the Lord has said to me about me or about my future or about who I am, good and bad, those have become the new framework for me understanding myself. And when the, the doubts or the fears or the sins attack, I, I reach through and grab hold of one of those things. I will go directly to the scripture or I'll look back at some of my, my journaling. And I hold on to the truth. And Jesus said, if you hold to my truth, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know, a lot of people are perfectionists, and they may not ever say this, but inside of them, they're, they're thinking to themselves, well, if I'm never going to achieve perfect holiness this side of heaven, then what exactly does God want from me? Because they can't imagine that middle ground at all being satisfactory to God. Well, let's face it. Our tendency is to look on the outside. We want to see measurable results. We want to see reduced temptations, holier thoughts. We want to see an elimination of failure, completely pure and holy heterosexual thoughts and feelings set only on the one we marry. We see these Christians on TV or in the pulpit who seem to have it all together, and we assume that they have arrived or else they wouldn't be there. And then we imagine a plateau of holiness or freedom from temptation that we are certain they must live in, a plateau that we must reach if we're ever going to be acceptable to God. And when we don't reach it, we become discouraged, concluding that God couldn't love us, that we've crossed some invisible line of sin from which He won't rescue us, that we're destined to be failures, or so might as well give in to our urges because they're never going to go away. Have you ever been there? I have. God, on the other hand, looks at the heart. His criteria for progress is very different than our own. His focus is set not so much on flawless perfection, but in tending that fragile desire for holiness that grows in us as we sit in His presence. His attention is drawn to the joy of seeing us take baby steps in the right direction. And He's wise enough to know that babies can't run marathons. In short, God's discerning eyes examines the intent of the heart, not the flawless accomplishment of that intent. He knows that we're learning how to die to self and yield to His power in us. He knows that these are totally foreign concepts to fallen human beings and that it takes time to gain proficiency in them. People do not embrace death easily. And God is taking us on a journey of dying to self, crucifying our flesh, renouncing pride and submitting to his lordship, lessons not easily learned. You see, God wants relationship, and he values that above all else, because he knows that as we fall in love with him, we will be transformed into his image. We will take on his heart, his will, and His loves. You see, holiness is not meant to be a performance designed to earn God's favor. Rather, it is meant to be the natural fruit of loving Him. Aren't you glad that God has raised up men like Russell Willingham? You see, Russell is a perfect example of what God's power and grace can do to turn a bad situation into a blessing. There he was, a total sex addict, following as hard as he could after the kingdom of darkness until one day God made him an offer. 
Turn to me and I will set you free, God said to him. And not only will I set you free, I will raise you up as a healer of bound and broken people. You will comfort others with the comfort that I give to you. You see, God isn't mad at you. He doesn't hate you. He died for you. He died on a cross to pay the penalty for all of the despicable things that you've ever done. He loves you more than you can ever know. Don't run from him, run to him. Tell him you're sorry. Ask him to forgive you through the merits of his son, Jesus Christ, and to set you free. Ask him to heal the broken places and to keep you from ever falling back into the cesspool from which he rescued you. God, I pray this for my brothers and sisters watching now. Set them free, Lord Jesus. Heal them, Father. Fill them with the power of your Holy Spirit. Give them new eyes to see the beautiful gift of sexuality rightly ordered in your plan. And Father, use them to tell their story of your power, love, and grace so that others can find freedom as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Until next week, I'm Christine for Pure Passion saying, God bless.